morning, everybody. How are you? Good morning. Um, so, thank you all for coming. It's um, slightly more of a bigger turnout than we expected at 10 o'clock in the morning, so thank you for that. Um, slightly less embarrassing than we're planning on. Um, so, this morning we're going to be talking about GDPR. Um, thankfully, it's not going to be me that's going to be talking to you most of it. It's going to be far cleverer than I am around this stuff is going to be helping. And then I'm going to jump in at the end and come to the bar table in terms of what we do from a marketing perspective. Um, we're using the hashtag today for GPR Manchester. Uh, feel free to use it if you want. Don't if you don't, it's fine. Um, we're going to try and combine some of the questions. So uh, after Michael's finished speaking, I'll present some of the questions that we've got for, uh, for you guys for him from a legal perspective. And then after I've finished as well, we'll, we'll go through some more questions. We're happy, happy to field those. So, my name, I think a lot of you know me. Um, my name is Richard Wood, uh, Managing Director for Six and Flow. Uh, we're an inbound marketing agency based here in Manchester. Um, we, we focus fairly heavily in the B2B sector, so professional services and tech uh, primarily. Um, we are a platinum uh, hotspot partner agency, um, which means we, we work with a lot of clients across um, the SaaS product hotspot. I think a few of you will be aware of that. Um, but typically what we focus on is growth marketing. So we look at how we help our clients grow rather than how we kind of pump up your, your traffic levels and all that kind of stuff. It's how many clients can we actually get across, um, across the line. So like I mentioned, today we're going to be talking about GDPR. So this, this event kind of came from the basis that when I was looking into GDPR and, and kind of what we could offer for our clients and how we could help them into the transition, everything out there seems to be doom and gloom. So GDPR is coming, it's going to ruin all of your marketing, you're not going to be able to do the stuff that you were doing previously. It's, it's bad news for the kind of marketing community. Um, my, my take was a little bit different on that. So, what, and Mike is going to come on and uh, talk about kind of his view on this and stuff, but my view on it is very much around the, it's an opportunity there. So, we're leveling out a playing field across uh, big companies and small companies. We're, we're starting to make it better for the consumer. So, like I mentioned, we come from an inbound marketing agency, and the whole premise of inbound marketing is to try and help somebody. Obviously, we're trying to sell to them as well, but we're trying to help them through that process rather than ram the message down their throat. And that, that kind of soft approach where people are actively looking for um, looking for that help fits perfectly with GDPR. So it's an opportunity to, for companies to move away, but it's an opportunity and a nudge for companies to move away from that brokering in data and kind of smashing the phones type mentality. So on that basis, I started to um, uh, chat to Michael, who um, thankfully has a similar view on GDPR, I, I think. <laughs> um, so, uh, and he, he's pulled together a, a presentation from a legal perspective, from looking at what are the actual rules that you need to start looking at, how does it, how does it work, um, what are the implica implications, and what are the opportunities. And then after that, I'm going to come in and say, uh, talk you through um, what we're doing as Six and Flow. So I thought I'd give you some real world example of what we're planning to do over the coming months. So, a couple of quick polls, um, audience participation, all that kind of stuff. So, who in, who in here, raise your hands, who thinks they understand GDPR? I'm, I'm not going to quiz you, it's, it's alright. So, one, two, okay. Was that scratching your head ish? Okay, cool. <laughs> who thinks they're ready for GDPR? As, as a business, not as an individual. No one, okay. Oh, one, sorry. That's good. Who thinks GDPR is not going to affect them? Okay, good. So at least we're all on the same page. Right, so give me pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Buckworth. So he's the managing partner for Buckworths, um, who are based in Manchester and London. Um, they specialise in uh, high growth and startup um, companies. And I'll let him kind of introduce himself. Um, I don't want to kind of kill his slides, but. Um, if you'd uh, help me welcome Michael to speak. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Rich. Um, just picking up on what Rich was, uh, was saying there, um, I think any of you who've been looking at the press around GDPR will have, will have seen that it's been lots of doom and gloom, it's been, you know, some of the, the reporting's been quite out there. Uh, my favourite actually was from about six, seven months ago. The Sun um, published a 
a headline um, when they sort of cottoned on to GDPR, uh, which, which was, which was they're coming for you, EU good pun that. Um, and it basically claimed that you know, normal businesses, builders, uh, carpenters, those sorts of people, are going to get hit with absolutely massive fines. And this was sort of the, the tenor of their, of their article. Um, if you spotted the financial press this morning, you'll see that the ICO um, have imposed another £400,000 fine on Carphone Warehouse um, for what, if you read it, is actually some pretty shortly data protection for the miners, to be fair. Um, so, you know, the background is all blue and blue. I actually have to say, I think it's a completely different thing. I mean, GDPR is, is I think, in most cases, really good. Um, we'll talk about some of the reasons why, but, you know, really what it's doing is it's updating the law, it's making it work for the current world. Um, and for businesses that are compliant, um, it gives a great opportunity to you know, be best looking at the competitors. Um, so really one of the sort of aims of today's talk is to try to get rid of some of the myths, to try to you know, help everybody understand why GDPR is important, but also it's a good thing. Um, and to be slightly uh, flippant about it, uh, it's a little bit like the last banana and the fruit bowl at the end of the week. GDPR is not all that. So, Before we kick off on sort of the GDPR piece, a bit, little bit about us and what we do. Um, I used to work on the dark side of law. I used to work for two really big US law firms. And then back in 2011, I set up Buckwist. Now, we're the only firm in the market who work exclusively with startups and high growth businesses. And most of our clients are, are tax, so digital, and tech. Um, as you can imagine, with that sort of client base, GDPR is, is key. It's, it's definitely applicable to all of our clients and something that you know, we've been working with clients for quite some time now to sort of help them get compliant with. Um, my take, and I, and I think the reality on this, is that GDPR applies to everybody. Every single business in the country um, needs to understand the implications of GDPR. The question is to what extent compliance is a, is a big deal or not. Uh, for many businesses, actually, compliance is really not that painful. It's just about understanding what you do, um, really understanding the way that you process data and, and why you're processing it, and making sure that your documentation is compliant. We're going to run through a couple of things. Obviously, most of this is quite high level. We're, you know, different businesses have different needs. Um, but at a very high level, we're going to start out by looking at the background. So where does this come from? What are we talking about? Um, we're going to have a, then a bit of a think about why GPR is good for business, why it's not all doom and gloom. Um, run through some sort of specifics, particularly around sort of uh, uh, marketing and, and, and how marketing works, and with a focus there on content. Um, and finally, just having a think about what businesses need to do to become compliant and to make sure that come a, uh, they're in a good position. So, to begin with, the background. Um, yeah. Um, so, so what's the background? The current position is governed by a couple of different bits of legislation. The main bit is the Data Protection Act of 1998. That came into force in 2000, so, you know what, uh, 17, 18 years ago, 17 years ago now. Um, the, the background to the Data Protection Act is that historically it's been relatively lightly enforced when you look at the comparison between us and other European countries. So that in some other countries, their level of compliance is way, way higher than ours. Um, what we've seen in the last couple of years as GDPR has got closer and closer is that compliance has got better and the regulator has got a little bit tougher in the way that they, they make sure businesses comply. So in the last couple of years we've seen some pretty substantial fines. Um, but it's still fair to say compliance in the UK traditionally has been quite poor. There, there was some research done by one of the big accounting firms um, sort of middle of last year where they looked at their client base who had contacted them to ask for an audit about compliance. So effectively, big companies contacting them saying, can you have a look at our data protection, what we do, um, and tell us if we're compliant with GDPR. So of the people who are contacting them, so these are proactive businesses, only 25% of them were actually compliant with the current regime. Um, so you can imagine when you go outside of those people who are bigger and proactive, what the level of compliance is, is going to be. You would, you would imagine it's pretty low. Um, GDPR is a is a European, a European piece of, of, of legislation, but it's very interesting to know it's actually been driven by the UK. So we think about the UK as a, a poor compliance jurisdiction. Actually, UK government's been quite proactive in driving some of the concepts in GDPR. Um, and to preempt the inevitable question, uh, Brexit may or may not happen. Um, GDPR is definitely going to happen. Um, GDPR is going to be automatically um, impact or automatically effective in UK law before Brexit happens, if we leave the European Union, 
when we did the European Union, um, the government has made very, very clear that, that, it, that the provisions of GDPR will remain part of English law. So please don't be too optimistic and think if we leave the EU, all this stuff will fall away. It won't. As well as the Data Protection Act and GDPR, there's other bits of legislation that are relevant. And the ones that we sort of most commonly think about are PECA, so the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. And they effectively govern direct marketing. So for those of you who are sort of familiar with um, the way that sort of direct marketing currently works, um, PECA is a really important piece of legislation. But that will continue to be the case going forwards. So GDPR doesn't get rid of, of, of all the requirements there. And secondly, the e-privacy directive. So the e-privacy directive is another bit of European legislation. It does a whole bunch of stuff. Um, the bit that it's probably most well known for is what was, what's called the cookies law. So if you think about it's 12, 18 months ago, all sorts of press around cookies and how, you know, how, how that works, that originated from the e-privacy directive. Now that directive is being updated currently, um, and it's being updated primarily to bring it in line with GDPR to make sure it's compliant. So within the sort of context of GDPR, we've got a whole bunch of other bits of legislation around it uh, and a whole bunch of additional guidance. So it's always worth sort of thinking about the context of this. What's the point of it all? Why are we doing all this? Well, the, the regulation itself talks about the objectives. And what they say is it's to give citizens back control of their data. So if you think about it, since the Data Protection Act, so back in 2000, the world's changed astonishingly. The amount of data that businesses collect is completely different. Huge amounts of, of data are processed by businesses every single day. Um, and what the European Commission is trying to do is say, you know, this data has a value, that's quite clear. Um, we want to give data subjects control of that data going forwards. And we want to give them the tools and the ability to do that. Um, the sort of second related concept is that the Commission has a uh, a very strong sort of drive towards what they call the digital single market. And this is an idea that within the Union, within the European Union, um, there's a kind of free flow of, of, of digital content and, um, and, and services provided by digital businesses that are uh, effectively free from borders. So it's this concept of harmonization throughout the EU. GDPR is a really important point of making that work. Um, worth saying, politically, um, the European Commission view this is very important. It's, it's a very, very key piece of legislation. Um, and something that I think, uh, you know, going forward, we're going to hear a lot more about. I don't think this GDPR is the last sort of um, bit of legislation on, on, on privacy. You're going to find a lot more legislation coming up over the next 10, 15 years to make sure that we keep up to speed with stuff. So why are we doing it now? Um, really, it's quite, it, it, it sort of follows from what I just said. It's trying to harmonize the, the approach to data protection across the union, uh, bringing data protection all up to date. Um, and making sure that the legislation that we have actually reflects the current world. So a classic example of this would be the Data Protection Act 98 doesn't really understand the concept, doesn't deal with the concept of profiling. So the idea that you have a user who comes onto your platform, um, you collect a whole bunch of data about that user, either the way they navigate to the platform, perhaps their geolocation data, um, you combine that, you create a profile of them. The Data Protection Act doesn't really deal with that. Um, so we're sort of updating and, and trying to catch up with the way that the world has developed. So one of the things that are changing, um, the, the way that consent works is the really big ticket thing that I think um, has got a lot of attention quite rightly and I think a lot of people are aware of. We're going to talk about that separately in a sec. But there are some other things that are worth just remembering. The first one is the meaning of personal data. Um, a couple of key things here. So the concept of, uh, of personal data has been expanded, explicitly expanded, to include all of that, that what I would call sort of platform stuff. So it's uh, cookie strings, website identifiers, the stuff that businesses collect as people move around their platform. On top of that, and the key thing to remember, contact information, business contact information, is now caught as personal data. Now for many businesses, that's quite a significant change. There has been, I, I would say, an advised approach, but there has been an approach that some people have taken that, well, if it's a business email, we don't need to worry about it, there's no legislation that applies, we can basically spam people left, right, and centre. That's actually never been the case, but it has, I think, been a misconception that people have, have thought it is business content details, they can do what they want with it. Explicitly, business content details are now caught, so you need to make sure that we're GDPR compliant for that, that information as well. 
On top of that, there's been an expansion of the concept of sensitive personal data, so what legislation calls special categories of data. <laughs> Specifically, the bits that are interesting here, I think, are with the inclusion of genetic data and biometric data. So that, in principle, has always been caught, but it's now very much explicit in legislation that it is a part of that sensitive data definition. But the crucial thing about sensitive data, if you're collecting and processing that special, those special questions of data, you have to um, have the additional um, uh, legal basis for processing it, and you have to have additional protections and controls in place. So really understanding if you're collecting sensitive personal data is going to be very important going forward. Second point, so the second sort of category of things that are changing, there's a couple of new rights out there. So currently, um, there are three rights that data subjects have uh, when it comes to their data. They have a right to object to, to direct marketing. So this is something that obviously any of you guys working in marketing will be very aware of, and something we'll talk about in more detail in a second. But effectively, a right to, to say, I don't want to be subject to direct marketing. The second existing right is to make a data subject access request. So you guys probably know, if you want to get a copy of the data your business holds about you, um, you can pay a tenner um, of the current regime and, and get them to send a, a, a copy of that data to you. Um, there's some changes to the way that works. Under the new regime, you don't have to pay a tenner anymore, great, albeit a business can charge you if um, your, your, your request is excessive, unreasonable, and you know, doesn't provide sufficient information. But in principle, it, you know, there are some changes to that right, but it's, it's broadly similar. And the final existing right is the, object, the, the right to object to automated decision making. So if a platform um, or a business is making decisions about what you can and can't do, so perhaps access to goods or services, based on an automated decision, then you have a right to object to that and stop them doing it. So those are the three existing rights. GDPR introduces two new rights. The first one is a right to be forgotten, so what's called the right to erasure, and the second is the right to, the right to data portability. Now the right to erasure, I would say, for, for most businesses, particularly in the context of marketing, is actually more important. Um, what this means is that um, in certain circumstances, and we'll talk about them in a sec, in certain circumstances, a data subject can request that, that the personal data business holds about them is deleted. Now the really important point here, if you imagine you've collected some, some personal data about um, your data subject, and that data is disclosed, um, is processed by third parties on your behalf, so perhaps by service providers, by other people who are doing things with that data. The data subject makes a request for their data to be deleted. You need to make sure the data is deleted not just from your systems, but also from the third parties processing it on your behalf. And what that means by extension, it's a statement of the obvious, but what it means by extension is you need to know where the data goes uh, and who's holding it and processing it on your behalf. Now what we have found, and it, it sounds odd, what we found as we've gone through compliance with clients is that they often know the data that they're collecting and they often think they know who's processing it and what happens to that data, but actually there's a, there's a break in the link somewhere and it, it transpires they actually don't know who's processing the data, they don't know what copies of data people have. Going forwards, that's a pretty big issue. So, you know, part of the compliance, we'll talk about the, the way the services work in a sec, but part of the compliance is actually understanding the way the data is, is flowing through your business and through people who you're working with. So the right to, to request for data to be deleted is subject to a couple of caveats. So there have to be uh, a reason to, to make the request. So the first one is that there's no compelling reason for that data to continue to be processed. So for example, let's say that we're working with a client and provide services to them, um, we, we, we terminate the relationship, we no longer have any relationship with them going forwards. There's a very strong argument to say there's no need for us to, to keep that personal data, it should be deleted. So that's no compelling reason. The second one, if somebody's given consent for processing personal data, um, they're entitled to uh, withdraw that consent and to request the, delay, the data to be deleted. So a classic example would be, someone's given consent for marketing, they withdraw the consent, you have no other reason to have that data, therefore it should be deleted. And the final one is the process, processing is unlawful. Um, it, it's a, a pretty much a suburban fact and very obvious under the legislation. If you're not allowed to process data, then somebody can require you to delete it. The data portability right, I think, is actually really fascinating from a, 
you know, sort of a business commercial perspective, simply because what it does is it actually gives people an ability to take data from one service provider and move it to another service provider. So if you take banking as an example, there's been moved towards more open banking in the last couple of years, that's quite apart from GDPR actually. Um, but the idea that you can take your financial information, so your, your bank statements and, and, and transactions from one bank, port them over to another bank, and therefore it means your ability to move between service providers is easier going forward. That concept has been built into GDPR um, and actually is quite, you know, for, for a bunch of service providers, is quite a, a powerful tool um, in, to, to help them get new customers, but also uh, the flip side is potentially a problem if you're trying to um, try not to lose customers. But something I think, certainly from our perspective, is quite an interesting, quite an interesting development. <coughs> so, having gone through that, the basics of what's changing, um, why is GDPR absolutely amazing for British business? Um, I think the first thing is, it, it really does update a bunch of really outdated laws. Um, the, the classic example of this one, and really put it into context, Google, um, so probably the biggest uh, platform generating, um, you know, processing the most amount of data in the world. Uh, Google was uh, incorporated on the 4th of September 1998. The Data Protection Act 98 came into law on the 1st of March 2000. So two years after Google was set up. So if you think about, that's when the, the Data Protection Act was drafted, effectively, you know, let's call it pre-Google, um, we're now, you know, what, 17, 18, 19 years further on, um, and we're updating the law to reflect all the stuff that's changed in that period. It really is a massive, massive update, um, and, and very, very much overdue. The second more important point, I think, it, it's designed to provide a level playing field across the EU. And this is really important for us poor Brits, who are going to have to go to the Brexit thing, um, not be part of the European Union. Um, we have one of the biggest digital um, uh, economies in Europe. Um, it's actually really important for us that there is a level playing field, and that we don't have a situation where our government requires us to meet certain requirements um, and to, to behave in a way that is you know, pro-data subject and our competitors, other European countries, don't do that. So it's, I think, a really great thing for, for the UK, particularly in the context of Brexit, that actually GDPR is providing a playing field. Um, and the final thing, and I think actually the most important thing here, um, it provides a great marketing opportunity and a great uh, sort of platform for businesses to actually compete better. So we've already seen some of our service provider clients, so you've got software providers, um, SaaS businesses, who they work with bigger companies. Bigger companies are saying, we will not work with you anymore unless you can tell us how you are going to be compliant with GDPR and unless you can give us some pretty big guarantees that you will be compliant come May. Um, businesses who are not compliant, my view is they won't be in business in 12 months time um, because certainly bigger companies just won't, have, won't deal with them. So really GDPR, it is mandatory obviously, but it's actually a great opportunity to uh, make sure that you're better than your competitors, that you've actually um, become compliant with the regime and that you're able to do business with everybody um, in a compliant way. Um, it's also, I'm sure Rich will touch on that, it's also a great tool for clients engagement. Um, you know, we've got lots of clients, you have seen this on the internet, lots and lots of businesses out there saying, you know, we can help GDPR compliance, use our, use our service because it improves your, your GDPR position. And all of that stuff, I think, is really helpful. <coughs> so, consent, I mentioned earlier, sort of one of the key changes um, introduced by GDPR is the way that consent works. So, um, if we go back to basics on this, um, GDPR applies to all businesses that are established in the EU and also those who are established outside the EU but who are providing goods and services within the EU. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but basically, if you're doing stuff in the European Union and you're selling to customers in the European Union, um, almost certainly GDPR will apply to you. Now, in order to process in compliance with GDPR, so to collect data in compliance with the regime, uh, you need to do two things. You need to comply with what are called the six principles, and you also need to have a lawful basis for collecting the data. So, Six principles, um, that's what they are. Uh, they are relatively similar to the current regime. There's not a huge amount of, of substantive change here. Um, everything you do in processing personal data has to meet these requirements. On top of that, 
you must have a lawful basis for each type of processing activity that you carry out. So these are the processing conditions. So there's a whole bunch of different ones. The ones I think that are most relevant and people think about most often are consent. So this is the idea that your data subject has given you consent to process the data in the way that you're processing it. So the classic example would be um, you get consent from the data subject to be able to send them marketing emails. So that's consent to processing condition. Um, the second sort of condition of no, I think, is contractual performance. Now this is something that actually a lot of businesses have, I think, forgotten about. Most of the processing activities that you carry out as a business are actually going to be covered by contractual performance. Um, so for example, we collect a bunch of data, um, we, we collect ID documents about our clients um, in order to comply with uh, you know, the requirements of our regulator, uh, also in order to be able to do companies house findings for them and, and provide legal services to them. Um, essentially, all of those activities are actually covered by contractual performance. For, if, you, if you're using contractual performance as a processing condition, you don't need consent for it. So you've got that contractual performance there. And the third one I'm just going to pull out of this is legitimate interest. We're going to talk a bit about legitimate interest in a minute. But legitimate interest is essentially that what you are doing is um, in, the, in, the, in the interest of your business, and crucially, it doesn't adversely impact the rights of the data subject. So that's the background. <clears throat> What's changing with consent? So consent <laughs> is generally the most commonly it's what people think is the most commonly used processing condition. I would argue it actually isn't the most commonly used, but a lot of people think it is. When we have conversations with customers, the conversation tends to go, oh yeah, everything we do is basically based on consent. And they've read GDPR, and as we'll see in a second, they've realized that every time you use consent as a processing condition, you must have an act, a tick box, that so people must actively tick a box to give their consent. And they have gone from here to here and concluded that that means that you know, they, they process information for 10 different purposes. That means they have to have 10 separate tick boxes, and that's going to muck up their UX. Um, and their, their UX guys and, and their user experience people start crying in the corner and throw themselves off bridges, and they're always very messy. Um, uh, consent is often nothing like as important as people think it is. They're very often using those other lawful um, uh, processing conditions as the reason for, for processing the data. So consent, the changes here, and it is very significant, the changes are that consent must be freely given specific and forms, unambiguous indication of the data subject's wishes. It has to be a positive statement. So in other words, pre-tick checkboxes don't work. That, for what it's worth, has always been the case. It's just lots of businesses weren't necessarily aware of it. So if someone's going to give consent and it's going to be, and it's going to be on your, online, on your platform, there's a tick box, they have to actually tick that tick box. The second point, and, and I think the thing that's, that people need to be aware of, is that for each type of processing going forwards, there needs to be, if you're relying on consent as a lawful condition, there has to be a separate consent for it. So let us imagine that you are, um, you're going to get consent for direct marketing, and you decide that you're going to get consent to, um, I don't know, collect data for a second purpose. So for each of those two purposes for which you're going to use that data, if you're going to use consent as the processing condition, you would need two separate tick boxes to be checked. Um, you can't try and hide this stuff. You can't, you know, try and get one tick box for the whole privacy policy. Basically, consent now, very high threshold, and needs to be done properly. Um, the implication of that is people are worrying. As I just said, people are very worried that they're going to have to get lots of tick boxes. It's all going to be very complicated. It's going to be difficult to, to, to make it work. Um, as I say, I don't believe that is a particular issue for most businesses. Um, what people need to do is actually go through, look at what they're doing with personal data, um, look at why they are processing it, and then think back and work out what the processing condition is. And we have certainly found in most cases it's contractual performance. So you'll find 90% of what you do is go by contractual performance. Um, you may have one or two areas where it's consent or legitimate interest. So how does this impact and how does this fit in to direct marketing? Million dollar question. So under the existing regime, um, and we're thinking actually mainly PEPA here, so the Group of Natural Communications Regulations. Um, 
The idea is that you need consent in order to send marketing communications. And there is a concept, um, if you like, a sort of a carve out um, of uh, a sort of soft opt in. Under the current regime, um, there's a couple of requirements for that. So basically, if you've obtained the data that you're using for the marketing in the context of negotiations around the sale of goods and services, that's the first one. The second one is that you're sending marketing communications in respect of similar or the same goods and services. And then the third condition is that at the point you collect the personal data, the, the, the data service had the opportunity to, to refuse consent. And when you send them marketing emails, um, they have an opportunity to opt out. So you remember that you, you probably remember at the bottom of marketing emails is always a, a little opt out thing. If you've met those three requirements under the current regime, the general view and certainly the market practice is that you uh, are compliant, you can send out those marketing emails. Under GDPR, the position is a little bit more complicated. The reason for that uh, is as follows. There's a distinction in practice between sending a, 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 an email to an email address. So if you imagine, uh, we're, not a, we're a law firm, we're not hugely sophisticated in the way that we do marketing uh, emails. Uh, we, let's say, have a mailing list. Um, that mailing list is all of our current clients. Uh, we send uh, a, a monthly newsletter uh, with stuff that's relevant to them. Um, that's just a straight email. We're not really putting any other data around that. We haven't really necessarily thought about you know, how relevant each bit is to the client. We haven't thought about the way they, they interact on the website. Uh, we haven't added any additional data to that. We're just sending an email to an email address. If that's what we're doing, consent covers it. It's consent to direct marketing. Where it gets trickier in the GDPR is where you do the cooler stuff, so the kind of stuff that Rich does. It's, it's where you start aggregating the data that you collect from people through your, your interactions with them. So when you start collecting, for example, you start aggregating the way that they interact on the platform, the way that they um, uh, you know, have looked at certain key search terms, um, perhaps their geolocation data. You start building a profile of them and you use that information to send them targeted specific emails. Now, of course, what you've done there is there's two things going on, aren't there? You're sending an email to them, but you're also processing a whole bunch of other information in order to make sure that email is targeted. Now, the key point on a GDPR is that you still need that consent to send the email. So you need that consent still, just as you do currently. But on top of it, you need to have a lawful condition for processing the rest of that data. So all of what I loosely call the platform data that you've used to, to target. So you effectively need two processing conditions. Now, it may be that the processing condition for all the rest of that platform data is consent. Maybe you've gone and got a second consent before that. But it may be you haven't. And this is where the processing condition of legitimate interest comes in. So the, the, the view in the market, and certainly the view amongst lawyers, is that the way to navigate through GDPR for these kinds of targeted commercial emails um, is actually to have the, the, the lawful um, processing condition uh, for all of the, the extra that platform data as being legitimate interest. In other words, it's in the interest of your business, um, it's a legitimate reason to collect that data. But the crucial, crucial thing to remember here, if you're going to use that processing condition, you can't be doing anything that is harmful or detrimentally <coughs> impacting the rights of the data subject. So you always, if you're going to use it as an interest, have to be sure that you're not doing something that is uh, it, it's going to adversely impact the data subject. That comes down to a, to a legal judgment. Um, and I think for businesses carrying out marketing activities, one of the really crucial bits of analysis I mean, in the context of GDPR compliance is actually going to be working out what that condition can be if it's going to be legitimate interest, really thinking through the justification for it, and doing the balance and the analysis of whether there's going to be a adverse effect on the rights of individuals. So the steps on this one in practice are, firstly, get consent for direct marketing, so get consent for those emails, and then on top of that, work out what the processing condition is for all of that platform data. Um, and, and in practice, what, what, what we advise clients do is they actually give data subjects a choice upfront when they sign up to the platform as to whether they want to receive standard 
you know, non-target emails, or if they want to receive more enriched, you know, targeted, you know, uh, uh, emails using some more of that sort of platform data. So, the sort of final thing to, that I really want to sort of touch on is what on earth do we have to do now to become compliant with GDPR? We've gone through all the stuff that's changed. We've thought about you know, some of the, the, the sort of niche points. What do we actually have to do? One of the sort of key things within GDPR is the concept of accountability. Um, but what that means is that businesses not only need to be compliant, but they need to be able to demonstrate compliance. So the way I would frame it is there's two bits to GDPR compliance. There's getting compliant. So in May 2018, making sure that you can tick a box and say, at this point in time, our business is compliant with GDPR. We are behaving in a way that is compliant. But that only gets you halfway there. Um, I would say arguably more important is actually maintaining your compliance, making sure that from that point onwards, you still behave in a way that is compliant, and being able to demonstrate that if the regulator come knocking. Um, so, splitting the sort of the, the implementation into two bits, becoming compliant, there's a couple of things we do. Um, for most businesses, we're going to do something called a data protection impact assessment. Now, technically, under the rules, you only need to do a data protection impact assessment in certain circumstances. And basically, it would generally be if you're introducing a new uh, service and that service poses a high risk of rights and freedoms of individuals. So the normal course going forward is that's a judgment you take. Is it likely to, to um, impose a high risk of rights and freedoms? If it does, we do a full-blown data protect, uh, DPIA, um, data protection impact assessment. Um, in practice, though, lots of businesses haven't done them. Um, if you have done them, well done. You're in a very small percentage of businesses that got this right. Um, you should, by the way, have done them already. The, there's not really a significant change in, 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 in the rules on the GDPR. Um, businesses should already have, uh, already have an obligation to do DPAs um, if they introduce new goods and services that, that, that uh, potentially adversely affect significantly the rights of, of individuals. But lots of businesses haven't done it. Um, if you haven't done it, the advice basically is to effectively do it before GDPR comes into effect. Now, it may be that's a full-blown DPIA. They are quite clunky. Um, it may be that actually it's a lighter touch on this of some kind. But basically, a mini audit um, of some kind of what you're up to to make sure we understand what data you're collecting, what you're doing with it, where it goes once you've, once you've brought it into your business, um, and, and what you need to do to become compliant. That's the sort of starting point. Now, the nice thing about doing a formal DPIA is it actually forms a basis of compliance going forwards. So it gives you a nice report that you can effectively use going forwards to, um, to evidence your, your compliance. Once you've done that, it probably generates a whole bunch of deficiencies. So we probably do the DPIA and conclude, you know what, you're not compliant here, we need to do this, 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 and this. Um, we probably need to put in a bunch of, uh, sort of background compliance policies. Um, so there's a bunch of, of recommendations um, that we then implement before May uh, of this year. Um, the implementation, as I say, is putting in a bunch of policies, probably updating the privacy policy, um, making sure that, for example, we've got the right consensus in place, make sure that, we, um, uh, that we've got absolute clarity in what conditions of processing we're using. Um, and crucially, I would say, reviewing your cyber insurance policies. Um, just on insurance, uh, insurance policies won't pay out, uh, they, they won't cover fines if you're not compliant. But what they should be covering is they should be covering costs, legal fees, um, expert fees in dealing with any data breaches, dealing with any problems with compliance. Um, and just to be clear, um, this stuff, as you can imagine, if you really do have a problem and something goes wrong, it can get quite expensive to resolve. So having decent insurance in place is, 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 is something to really think about. Once you're compliant, we tick that box, everything's good. We then need to maintain compliance. And there's really a couple of points on this one. Firstly, you should be doing regular reviews of your compliance. Um, what we would recommend to clients is a quarterly review, sit down with management, see what's happened, see any issues you've raised, you know, talk about what you might be doing in the future, or you're going to introduce new goods and services, um, and make sure that we're catching any problems quickly. Um, those reviews should obviously be written, that creates a record of what's going on. So if the, the regulator comes knocking, you can demonstrate that on compliance. Um, 
if you are um, if you are doing uh, stuff that, that poses a higher risk to the rights of free speech of individuals, so I mean, let's say you're processing a whole bunch of sensitive information, you may um, need to appoint a data protection officer, which is a sort of dedicated person who um, uh, who effectively handles these sorts of ongoing compliance matters. But I think either way, regular reviews. The second one, making sure your staff understand what the hell they're supposed to be doing. Um, one of the things that we have found, and when we sort of talk to clients, is that actually often nobody really understands what they're supposed to be doing. But even where there are people who do, the people who are actually on the ground collecting the data, you know, the customer services guys, the sales guys, they're the people who have the least clue what's going on. Um, generally, there's somebody uh, in management who does kind of know what they should be doing, but often that hasn't sort of been fed down to the people on the ground. So making sure that everybody understands their obligations is, is important. And again, recording that training so that you can demonstrate you've done it in the future. And then finally, making sure that if, if stuff does go wrong, it does happen, that you can deal with stuff uh, in a timely manner. Um, breaches, where there's been a, a, a breach of data, so data has been unlawfully um, accessed or disclosed, um, you do have enhanced obligations now to tell the regulator about it um, in certain circumstances in a very short period of time. Um, in line with that, you also potentially have to tell data so that you have to make public announcements. Um, one of the things that the ICO has flagged is that they do expect businesses to meet those timeframes. So obviously being able to meet them and having advisors in place who can help if there is a breach is really important. Um, I've included a, ch a checklist of compliance just because um, it's something we get asked about quite a lot. Um, this is sort of all of the policies, if you like. You don't necessarily need all of them. It's obviously business specific. Um, uh, but you know, if you're at the most complex end of the spectrum, you're doing pretty much everything you can see that we're doing. Um, that's most, if not all, of the stuff that um, that you might need to put in place. Um, what I would say about this kind of stuff, um, there is a temptation when it comes to compliance to go to the nearest precedence website, pay a tenner, and download a whole bunch of documentation. Um, I would sort of advise against that. Uh, the reason is that. You know, hopefully you've, you've got a feel, uh, just from this sort of brief introduction, that actually compliance is quite specific, it's very much tailored to your business. Downloading a sort of standard document, it may get you there, but it also may not. Uh, and in the grand scheme of things, it's probably marginally, uh, you know, not hugely more expensive to get a tailored suite of documentation, as opposed to um, sort of trying to, to figure it out from a potentially dodgy uh, precedent website. Um, that's everything from me. Um, the only thing I would finish it with is we, we have a intro to GDPR brochure, um, which you can download from our website, which is buckwistcompliance.com. Um, or my colleague Marion has a, a box of them over there. Um, it gives a little bit more information on some of the topics I've talked about, um, and also gives a sort of a, a bigger breakdown and um, has a bit more information about the, uh, the documentation. Right, so <clears throat> uh, thanks, Barbara. I've, uh, I've got a number of questions um, that we've got from social from a few of you, and then we'll open up to the floor as well. Um, the first one, uh, do you know what personal data actually means? What's the definition of personal data? This is a very good question. Um, it, it's basically, it, it's data that identifies directly or indirectly um, an individual. So, um, if we go back, so there was an earlier slide where we sort of listed like, what's included in personal data, but it, it seems like, you know, it's name, email address, contact details, but also if you've got somebody who, um, if, if you have a profile on a website, so, um, I don't know, you've got a, a user who's got a, a profile, it, it would also include any sort of information that is allocated to that profile, so, I don't know, geolocation data, so the way they track to the platform, the cookie identifies the platform and stuff. So, I, so, an email address or a phone number, like a mobile phone number, could identify an individual. Yeah, it would do. Yeah. What about an address where it can identify a family or group of individuals? Does that still count as personal data? Because that's. Is it? Essentially, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, who governs GDPR? Well, that, that's an interesting question. So, um, each. European member state has a, a regulator. So in the UK, it's the ICO, the Information Commission's office. Um, the, the person who governs compliance with data protection rules for a business is the regulator in the country in which they have the main place of business. So effectively, if you've got a UK company, you're operating out of the UK, it's going to be the UK regulator. 
Um, if you were operating in multiple jurisdictions, what you sometimes will have is you'll have the main regulators, perhaps in the UK, you'll have a secondary regulator in the other jurisdiction. If something goes wrong, you would generally res you, you would report to your main regulator. Um, we recommend clients copy that to secondary regulators. Um, but it's basically going to be your, your regulation in your home, I'm Okay. Come 25th May, will there be a window of leniency? No. Okay. Uh, not at all. Um, the, there's nothing in GDPR that, I mean, GDPR has been trailed. Um, it, it's been final for, what, over six months now. Um, that's the window of opportunity. Um, it becomes fully effective in, in, in May. Um, yeah, I don't think it's going to be any leniency. And, and for what it's worth, my view is the ICO are already ramping up um, on enforcement to get ready for GDPR. So to put it in context, um, you probably know currently you need to register with the ICO um, if you're dealing with personal data. Uh, it costs £35 a year, pretty straightforward. Um, previously, the ICO would send reminders that it needs to be renewed, but wouldn't do very much more. Um, we have actually seen in the last six months or so the ICO sending out fines for non-renewal, um, and I have never seen that previously. So I think yeah, you need to be fine. What about B2B data? So, I mean, B2B data, it depends what it is, but if it identifies individuals, then yes, it will It will be caught by personal data. So business, email address, so michael.buckwith at that's personal data. But what if that personal data is available in public domain? So you've got that list on your website, is it still coming up to the uh, It is, so um, maybe something put in the public domain doesn't get you outside of this kind of stuff. Um, and I think that is probably going to be it's, it's a difference in practice to the way to, to the current regime and the way that people think it works, yeah. Um, I've got a customer base. Do my customers have the right to ask me to forget them? So can can my customer phone me and say, we're still your customer, but I don't want you to hold any data on you? Uh, it, it depends. In all probability, um, no. Uh, and I think your argument would be that you need the personal data to provide services to them um, and, 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 and for general legitimate interest. Um, so in all probability, not. Um, you, you mentioned it, but it's one of the questions we get asked by our clients a lot. But we're leaving the EU. So despite, despite Brexit, these rules will remain. They will remain, yeah. Um, there is absolutely no way in a million years these will not uh, remain after Brexit. Um, and the government made it absolutely abundantly clear this is going to be remain whatever happens. Here. Okay, so we, we as a marketing agency, so we use a lot of SaaS products, so HubSpot, we use Google Apps, we use all sorts of things like that. Am I responsible for how they're handling my client's data or the personal data that I'm using them through? Who's responsible in that relationship for the regulation? So as an aid controller, you do have an obligation to, to make sure that your processes are compliant. Um, so what you would look for uh, is you look at what we call processing uh, clauses in agreements with your processes that, that effectively say that they have behaved in a way that is compliant. Um, and it's clearly going to depend on the size, the relative size and the negotiating power. But in an ideal world, you have an identity um, from them in the event of a, of a breach by them of the GDPR. Um, there's a, there's a bit of a sort of common sense approach here. Clearly when it comes to, if you take Gmail as an example, um, you know, if you, go to, if you go to Google and say, I want to rasp indemnity for GDPR compliance, they're probably going to laugh at you and not be terribly interested. Um, but in an ideal world, you know, you do want protection for that kind of stuff. Um, the same actually for what it's worth, guys, goes on um, yeah, sort of mailing lists and, and email lists. If you think about buying in a, a contact list, um, you know, there's a couple of, of, of bits of stuff around that. Obviously, that contact list has to have been created in a way that is compliant with the regime, so it probably needs consent to be in, in, in all reality. Um, you can't just simply buy a list and go, well, I bought it. I just assumed it was compliant um, and just behave as if it is. You, you do have an obligation to make sure that, um, that you know, that, that it is compliant and that you behave in a way that is appropriate. Okay. Um, any, any questions from Okay, so it's a bit of a long question, but the way, the way I've been looking at GDPR is quite interesting. And I've been looking at it in respect of driving, driving tests, driving fines, so on and so forth. So at the moment, what I'm hearing is if you do something wrong, you'll get fined. If you go down a one way street, one way, you'll get fined. If you go too fast, you'll get fined. So if you don't comply, you'll get fined. 
what I'm having difficulty with is finding out how to drive the car. So, nobody's telling me, actually, this is a car, this is the engine, this is the key, this is the gear stick, and this is how you drive. Nobody's giving me an experience. And is, is there any way of understanding that? Not only that, nobody's telling me how to secure the car or where to get service. And you know, a lot of legal firms are saying, as we would do, yeah, you, you get fined, um, as you would do the driving, come to us and we'll help you get off that fine. So I can see it, it's not just about understanding or knowing what the problems are or what the, the rules of the road, road are, but it's actually how to implement them and actually get under the bonnet and do it. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think any law firm who is saying you get a fine will help you get off it um, should probably be shot. Uh, that's obviously not the way to do it. Um, you know, getting compliant in the first place is. No, I'm talking but, about speed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think first thing what I would say is um, when it comes to the guidance on enforcement, yes, clearly the fines are potentially very large. But actually, what the guidance says is that as long as you have tried your best to be compliant, and as long as you have can demonstrate that you've taken steps to compliance, the most likely um, recourse against you in the event of, of first of breach is going to be a, a written warning. So, as long as you're doing your best to be compliant, as long as you've taken the right advice and you've put in place you know, appropriate procedures, in all probability you're going to get a warning. You're not going to get hit. How, with the how, do, you do, how do you do a DPIA? Yeah. You know, so it's, it's like you drive a car. How do you drive? How do you do the yeah. I think I think on the on the sort of how to and how to get compliant. I think one of the difficulties with with this stuff is that oh, there's two problems. Firstly, it is very very business specific. Um, so you know, we do talks in intro to start of law, um, and we run through stuff like you know what do you need to do in this type of business. Frankly, most of that's quite generic. Um, it applies to you know if, if everyone in the room is setting up a new business. 90% of what we say would apply to all of them in the same way. Um, the problem with this kind of stuff is it's so business specific, you can't say in a generic way, you know, this is absolutely what you would have to do, this is the way through it. Um, it is a case really of sitting down, working through your business, working at what data you take and what to do with it, um, and, and, and putting in place compliance from there. Um, the general stuff is do a DPIO with the implementation and recommendations from that, you then know what your sort of route to compliance is. Um, how do you do the DPIA? I mean, uh, honestly, I would say don't try and do it yourself. Like, get get someone to do it who knows what they're doing. Um, that's probably going to be a compliance question as well, to be honest. Um, but I mean, the principles of it is really uh, looking at it's identifying what data you collect, what the flow of that data is through your business, you know, where you might store it. So it's probably in your CRM, you know, your email client, a bunch of other places. Um, working out what the lawful processing condition is. So the, for each process that you do with the data, what the legal basis for that is. Um, and then looking at where the risks are. So looking at the gap analysis, working out you know, where stuff can go wrong. Um, uh, the the car and warehouse, warehouse example I gave a minute ago, the £400,000 fine, um, there were lots of stuff they did wrong. <laughs> Actually, one of the things they did was they, they basically had a generic login to their WordPress website um, that somebody had left a really generic login on there, and basically somebody just logged in using that generic and accessed 1.3 million um, sets of contact details. You know, that kind of stuff is pretty stupid. Um, but I mean, in principle, very tailored, more than happy to chat off right about the detail. And judging by the memories, I've been touching a fair few people in the generic logins. Do you like response? It's actually, um, I am not admitting this, but we, our, our compliance website, we, we've got a separate website from the law firm. Uh, we've just had it set up. And um, up until yesterday, I mean, it's clearly not been trained and went live yesterday. But up until yesterday, it was actually generic. It was admin ads and, and, and admin was the password. So I do get how it happens. Um, you touched on, um, I'm going to ask on, sorry, Richard. Yeah. You crowd me. You touched upon it, but how are big companies that are outside the UK How's it going to affect them? And how is that going to be enforced? So, obviously, it applies to businesses within the EU. Businesses outside the EU, Sorry. yeah, outside the EU, it applies to them if they are effectively doing business in the EU or if they're targeting uh, goods and services out of the EU. Um, if they've got a place of business within the union, it's easy, there'll be direct enforcement against them. Um, 
if they're through, through that through that place of business. Um, if they're outside the EU, it still applies, um, and and the regulator has an ability to to, to go after them in the home jurisdiction. Um, Retro sort of fitting list to existing databases, so say you've got a list but it doesn't match all those tick boxes on that checklist. How would you go about that Look from a lead perspective and rather than just you can't you don't know, want the email and people say you need to opt in to do it and you shouldn't be emailed doesn't it originally anyway? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's probably what the next six months is, is, is really about, is, is sorting out those sorts of issues. Um, I think the first thing is to work out what the, the condition, process of condition is. If it is consent, then you're going to have to check and see whether the consent that you've already got is actually valid under the new GDPR definition. Um, the problem is if it's not, you don't have consent, therefore you either go and get it or you delete the data. Um, I think there's a, you wouldn't necessarily frame it this way to the regulator, but there is a common sense approach on this, which I think uh, certainly with some of our clients, what they're doing is they're taking their existing database, they're saying to themselves, you know what, it's probably not compliant with GDPR, but we're going to spend the next six months effectively enriching it. Um, so getting proper consents um, or, or, or getting that process in place for that data um, on an ongoing basis so that by the time GDPR comes in, it can demonstrate compliance for, you know, 90% of the rates from whatever it is, and just to continue enriching. Um, the other thing that the businesses are doing is some there's a great opportunity for data enrichment companies. Um, so lots of, of companies who have been doing that sort of big data thing, collecting huge amounts of data, um, and then obviously, uh, I mean, being cynical about it, those companies probably scraped LinkedIn. If you're thinking about business data, they probably scraped LinkedIn years ago, got all of that information database off there, and what they've then done is they spent the time since, you know, actually genuinely um, in a compliant manner enriching that data to make sure that they have the right consent in place to be able to do what they do with it. Um, a number of our clients have dealt with some of this, some of these issues by actually saying, all right, fine, we'll just buy in uh, enriched data and just match it to our existing database and, and, and enrich the data that way. But you're right, it is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it might have just been answered by that question, but I didn't quite hear exactly what was asked. Can I just double check? Um, so, you know, most businesses have contact database, CRM, list, whatever. So, the way to make sure that you mark the client is basically to re validate. Uh, 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 it's to re, re validate over the next few months so they'll get consent again. Because those, I mean, I'm just thinking about mine, mine comprises of people that have directly asked to be on it. That have been to events and were, you know, and so on and so forth. So, could I give a list of uh, clinical evidence as to exactly how people consented to be on that list? Not, not 100. So. Yeah, I think I think to the extent you're able to backtrack and work out, you know, who gave consent, what the form of consent was, and you can, you can split the data out, helpful. It may well be that you have a, a, a valid GDPR consent for some or all of that data anyway. Um, so I think you know backtracking if you can and working what you did at the time and, and where where the process and conditions come from is is helpful. Above and beyond that, it, yeah, it's, it's it's enriching the data, so it's taking steps to make sure that. Um, you're compliant, you've got a compliant process condition with GDPR going forward. Um, it's, I think it's a lead on for that. Uh, people who offer you a business card, is that consent? And how do you report that in, in your... So, um, you're quite right. And, and this one, this one I, I'm very, I'm very, um, what's the word? Uh, I, I hesitate on the answer to it. Um, it, it seems to me that it isn't consent. And the reason I say that is because if you look at the definition of consent, it requires a sort of a, a, a physical opt-in. Um, uh, well, actually, let me rephrase it. It's not that it isn't consent, it's that it's very difficult to demonstrate that consent. Because if you, if you get business, yeah. So that would be So, yeah, exactly. So, I, I feel it probably isn't. Um, what I would say is there was uh, at a talk we did probably six months ago, uh, there was somebody from the ICO uh, whose view was actually quite strongly that that was absolutely fine and that they, they pointed out that you don't need to have a written uh, affirmative consent, you just need to have an affirmative consent and that that can be done orally. 
Um, and they suggest exactly what you just suggested, that having the business card is, is some evidence that, 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 um, uh, that, that they've given consent. Um, two weeks later, there was another ICO person at a separate event, uh, and she was very much in the view that it wasn't sufficient. And the argument that she ran, um, which is I think probably the one I tend to agree with, is that if you give someone your business card, you probably give them the business card, or, or the theory would be, you give them the business card so that they can perhaps send you um, information about their services, they can perhaps even negotiate some goods or services with them. Um, it's unlikely that they're giving you explicit consent to be added to a database to be sent mailing emails. And I think that adding somebody's uh, contact details to an actual mailing list and sending them direct marketing, um, having received a business card from them as a networking event, uh, I don't think they'd be able to send for that processing, personally. So if you were to sort of have a, if you did do an email campaign, and you had a box, I met you at a, and then she gave me a business card, please opt in, would that be sufficient? Well, so the, the original email you send them is potentially a direct marketing email for which you don't have consent. Obviously, if they then opt in, they're giving you consent, so from that point onwards, you're fine. And the ICO have sent out, have, have imposed penalties on people for sending an initial email without consent. Um, hence, I'm, hence, I said I was sensitive, sensitive to ask, answer this one. Um, I personally think there's a way around it. I think the way around it is you get a business card of somebody at an event. You send them uh, a follow-up email saying, "Hi, met you at this event. Really great to, to meet you. Um, you know, we talked about the fact that I provide legal services. Let me know if something we can help with." Um, if you build into that email somewhere a link to be added to your mailing list, so if you'd like to go to our mailing list, click this link, and then they opt in, then I think you've solved the problem. Um, but I think personally, my personal view is you need to an affirmative option for that, for, for direct, to, to add them to direct direct marketing about this. Thank you, question. Uh, well, I'm happy to one side. Yeah. Um, do you have a view on use of legitimate interest condition for direct marketing to um, like existing customers and things like that? Yeah, so um, it's, it's basically looking at, you're right, it's just an interest. Can, can most probably be, um, that's probably be the process condition for um, uh, for marketing. Um, you just need to make sure that, that you're comfortable that it's not having an adverse impact on yeah. on the rest of premium. So I think it's a common sense approach here. What I would say though is that really the guidance, the, the approach of the guidance is you have a consent for the direct marketing itself, and then you have you use legitimate interest for. Um, any of the ancillary sort of data that you're, you're, you're processing around it. So it's that idea about the sort of enriched part of the answer. Sorry, I can't read it. First one, the answer you gave on the business plan. Um, the ICO guidance on the consent is still outstanding. Is that going to be out soon? It will help us with anything. It hope, wouldn't it? Um, I actually think that guidance was supposed to be out back in November. Um, but yeah, it's 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 not there yet, and, and there's a bunch of other guidance that hasn't come through. Um, I, I think it will help. I mean, the ICO are very aware of this kind of stuff. Um, certainly, the guys we've spoken to, they're, they're acutely aware of, 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 um, of the issues and the problems in the market. And I think they'll do their best to to, to clarify, you know, when they can. Okay, on the EU, you said that the um, is what we will the last. So the current one's going to be covered by the UK law. Uh, Pre-printing, what can we see there in use of what we have set in the UK law, or are we doing part of that? I mean, uh, so, so GDPR is directly affected from May. Um, the data protection bill was going to go through Parliament. Uh, it doesn't do very much. All it does is tweak little bits and pieces. So, for example, the age of the age at which you, you can use as a child in the UK will be 13, and as soon as 16. Um, Post Brexit, God knows. Um, uh, ask the Prime Minister. I don't, I don't think she knows. Um, uh, I think probably the way I would look at it is it depends on the way that our access to single market works. But if you are not a member of the single market um, and you want to access as a non-member state, um, you basically can access on single market terms if your regulatory regime is is, is equivalent to that of the uh, union. 
So it seems to me that, in all probability, our data protection laws will remain the same as or very similar to those of the European Union for the foreseeable future. Um, and I think, you know, potentially over time we start to diverge in small ways. But I think what I would point out, the UK has been hugely, hugely um, pushing GDPR. A lot of it comes down to what our government has pushed. I think it would be counterintuitive for the government to post Brexit so that we start diverging from that. Well, last one, very quickly, you mentioned about the audit, etc. I know you want to get clients to ask you all to come in and do it. Is there any sort of self help? Um, yes, I can actually, with a slight grin on my face, say so go with go the ICO's guidance on DPIAs. Um, and uh, when you've read it, pick up the phone to me because uh, it's so complicated, uh, you will definitely conclude you need help. A couple more. Just, just to be um, absolutely clear, we have data on our database. That's not opted in with consent. Do we, can we just not use it, or do we have to actually physically remove it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, in, in all probability, physically remove it. Um, you know, holding, storing that data is still processing uh, in data protection at terms, so it's in GDPR terms. So um, if you don't have the right to have it, you shouldn't have it. You should delete it. General Roberts, you Hey. Sorry, so one of my biggest concerns is around identifying that consent in a data subject. So it's looking at if you've got a form on a website that specifically asks for consent for processing and storage of that data, anyone can put anyone's email address into that. So I guess the big ones are around it's double opt-in. So it's that confirmation to be on that mail. Do you think it has to be sort of at that double opt-in stage? So you've got opt-in for consent, opt-in for processing, and then opt-in to be on that mailing list is identified through that inbox so that they've pressed it and opted in at that stage. And if not, if you don't have that for a <coughs> of your database, those that don't have it, that aren't double opted in, do you consider them not opting in at all because you can't identify that it's them with significant email address? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it you don't forget on this stuff, there is a risk-based approach. So you're entitled to, to look at the risk of the rise to uh, data subjects and, and take a view. Um, in, in some circumstances, double opt-in is, is going to be relevant, but I, I think for most normal businesses, it's probably not necessary. I think you know the normal process is you, you, have, you, you have the opt-in, that triggers an email to the email address saying, hey, you've opted in, um, let us know. You, know. you can opt out here if you didn't mean to. Um, in, in most circumstances, that's fine. So as long as you've got sort of the opt-in process, you've got on subscribe form and then you have emails that go out, you can opt out here, that seems sufficient in the GDPR. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two more questions, please. Yeah, um, just a quick question on personal uh, data. We run a network of freelancers and I saw a thing up there about contractual performance. So if a freelancer has worked with us for a couple of years and then ends up and says, remove my data, how much of that data are we allowed to keep? Because we obviously need that as part of contractual. We've paid them. We need that on our records to say, this is what we've paid them. Yep. So what do we do in that situation? Do we completely remove them? Or can we keep that data to say, if anybody like the uh, HMRC comes along and says, this person worked for you, can you tell us when and where to pay? Obviously, we remove that data. Yeah, that so where is the balance there? So, so the right to radio is an absolute. Um, it, it is subject to uh, to them falling into um, effects of an exemption. So, um, you know, the sort of data you're talking about, you have an absolute right to keep it. Um, it's it's uh, it's needed for your business. You need it to, to demonstrate stuff to what you want to see. The question is, that there is also an obligation on the GDPR data minimisation. So, uh, so data minimisation and also. Um, <laughs> In making sure you don't keep data for longer than you need to. So I, I think the question, the question is how long do you need that data for? Um, HMRC can come after can, can come after you for tax purposes for up to six years. So I think the default from sort of the lawyer's perspective would be you keep that stuff for six years. Um, you know, six years after you've not done business with it anymore, um, regardless of whether they ask that data to be deleted, frankly, you probably should be getting rid of it anyway because arguably you don't need it anymore. Um, 
So I suspect the answer, it's going to be case specific, but I actually suspect the answer for the sort of data you're talking about is going to be that you don't have an obligation to erase it in the first place because you need to keep it. Um, and obviously you would, you would just have to check whether there is any data that doesn't fall into that. So for example, perhaps email addresses, our contact details you may not need, you may just need to keep the transaction data. So let's say, just to twisting that a bit more, let's say a freelance is registered with us, they've not worked with us for six months, and then ask not to be, oh, we've blacklisted them because we've done something wrong. Um, what, uh, obviously we will need to know that that person was blacklisted because they did this, so they can't apply again. So does that need to be removed as well? Yeah, so it's the, it's the funny question, isn't it? Um, if, if somebody has a right to have their data deleted, uh, and therefore you have an obligation to delete it, uh, when you deleted it, how do you know you deleted it? Um, the answer is you can keep a record uh, of the fact you have deleted data. Um, so in most circumstances, you, you, it depends how you run your business, but you, know, you, might, keep, you might keep the, um, the name or something like that, um, but not, obviously not the background data. Um, and obviously, you just need to make sure that you're not, you know, you're not, you're not keeping the rest of the data. You're not continuing to process the rest of it. But you are allowed to keep a record that you've you deleted it. Okay. Last question. So you said earlier that um, consent can be granted orally. So does that mean that you can verbally ask someone to consent? To, and is there guidelines on on the wording that you need to use? Uh, so, so again, it can be granted orally, and you can ask for consent. Um, there are guidelines. Um, I think the ICO has actually got some somewhere. Um, top of my head, I can't, I can't remember what they are. Um, but yes, you can do it. What I would say, though, is your big problem is then demonstrating consent. Um, because you have to, going forward, you're going to have to, as a demonstrator, they give you consent. Um, so what do you do about that? You probably maybe send an email to them in, in confirmation. So. You know, if you're thinking about telemarketing, for example, um, uh, this is not a good way of doing it at all, but theoretically you could you could have a conversation with someone over the phone, you could say, do you have consent to receive direct marketing? Um, they say yes, uh, you know, maybe you've recorded the call, so you've got a record of it that way, or maybe you sent a follow-up email to them saying, hi, you know, just to confirm you get consent for direct marketing, you've been able to marketing email us if you're not opt out, but there's not time then. I think, so the answer is yeah, it's, it's demonstrating. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so, as I said before, he is a lot cleverer than I am. So, what I'm, what I'm going to do now is uh, kind of take you through a bit of what we're planning to do over the next uh, coming months, uh, kind of leading up to GDPR, and kind of our take on how we're going to position the kind of market that we do. Um, I think the caveat to that is just because Michael and I are speaking at the same event, he's not signed off on any of this stuff. This is like our view as a, as a marketing agency on how we're going to approach this. <clears throat> so, who in here is responsible for the marketing of the company? So, a, a good chunk of you, I've said about a 50% split, okay? And who of you would say that you have a plan for GDPR? I know I asked uh, who, who's ready for it, but who has a plan in place? So one, two, three, okay. Who knows what that number is? Any, any guesses? It's fine. Dance on the Perfect. You wrote that game. <laughs> so, a little over four months with a bit of change until GDPR comes into effect. So you have you have a bit of time. You're kind of cutting it cutting it fine, but you do have a bit of time to get get processes in place, the, the kind of stuff that uh, Michael's talking about, um, making sure that you are compliant. There is time left, so it's not like this is happening tomorrow and you're going to have to run out of here and fix everything immediately. So what I'm going to go through is some tips from us as an inbound agency. So this is. This is pretty specific to the way that we work. So, um, like I mentioned before, we, we work on an inbound basis. We don't we don't break the data. We don't cold call. That's not the kind of marketing we do. It's not kind of what I'm referring to here. But for me uh, and us as an agency, it's important to think about the end goal. So, think about what you're trying to achieve in this. Um, presumably, most of you in here, if you're running a business, will have a database of some sort, whether that's a, a CRM, a spreadsheet, a, a file of facts, or however that data is being stored. But presumably, there's a database there. You need to make sure that that data is compliant, so opted in and uh, 
I think one of the questions down here is kind of how do we how do we prove that? You need to, from our perspective, you need to be able to prove or demonstrate that you've got the the permission to be able to do that. Um, you have a, a, a unique ex, uh, excuse to start spring cleaning all your data. So where where quite often as marketers we're not necessarily looking for an excuse to start uh, communicating or sending out emails, but you need a, a basis. To we have a like a, a significant piece of regulation coming up, and you have a, a, a lever that you can pull on to be able to start uh, communicating people, with people about this. Um, as an end goal, you want better quality data as well. So you don't want a shitty old list that's been sat there for years where you don't know what the provenance of the data is, you don't know how, uh, how that uh, data is going to start uh, working for you as a business. You don't, you don't necessarily want that anymore. You only want stuff that people want to be uh, engaging with you. They want, uh, and you want data that is, people are going to um, respond. Um, and, and lastly, you don't want to piss off the ICO. So that's, that's for me, is like, there's two regularly borrowed uh, bodies that I, I try and stay on the right side of. One is the FCA and the other is the ICO. And for me, like, I mean, there's, there's some fairly hefty fines that are kind of floating about. And for me, they're, they're a body that I quite like to stay on the right side of. So to start with, review your data. Have a look at what you've got. Look at where it came from. Look at how old it is. Look at if you're sending out email communications, if you're, you're using MailChimp, HubSpot, Constant Contact, or any of those systems, you'll be able to see what kind of response rates you're getting from this data. You'll be able to see who's opening it, who's clicking it, who's responding. And you'll be able to see that going back, presumably, as long as you've, you've stored that data. Segment your data, so start to look at um, who, who your customers are, who, who your uh, prospects in that are, who your leads are, and then start to build up a strategy around each of those segments specifically. So you're obviously going to start dealing with your customers in a different way to how you're going to deal with cold leads that are, or warm leads that are coming to your business. Don't uh, download a shitty template. So this this comes uh, back to kind of Michael's point. So yes, yes, you could in theory do this yourself. And I mean, as a, as an agency, as a, a marketer, as somebody who's run a business, I've been guilty of previously buying templates that you can swap out some names, and hopefully that does a job. That's not the way to go, in in my honest opinion. Yes, yes, you can do it, but I think it, it needs more due attention than that. Um, Update your data catchers, so make it very clear what you're going to do with the data. So when somebody's entering data, they're downloading a guide or a brochure or whatever it is, at that point make it explicitly clear what you're going to do with that data. So are you going to start communicating with them, sending them email communications, or is it just you're going to respond to them? Make it clear what's happening with the data. Um, speak to your um, software and SaaS providers, so again, I mentioned that we're a hotspot partner. We, we have had conversations with HubSpot where they are now um, sending us a, a letter saying that they are compliant in this stuff. So we have that as a as a backdrop. So we're preempting that if, God forbid, there were any ever issues or breaches or anything like that, we have that backing from HubSpot now saying, yes, as far as we're concerned, we are compliant. Um, so do that with all your providers. Again, um, like Michael mentioned, Google will probably laugh at you for that sort of stuff, but making sure that you've got all of your, your ducks in a row before uh, anything goes wrong is my advice to you. Um, and make it easy uh, for people to see what you hold on them. So if, if somebody is asking for uh, to understand what it is that you, what, what kind of data you're holding on them, what kind of processes are, make it easy for them to understand that. And also make it easy for them to step back out of this process as well. So give them a way that they can edit their data, remove their data, or at least notify you that they want to make a change or don't want you to be uh, contacting them anymore. Make your forms clear. Um, like I said, make it very clear why you're collecting the data. Don't just store this in your T's and C's. So previously there would be a, um, and we've, we've all seen them, either um, opt-in or opt-out. At the bottom of a form you would have the kind of, you agree to be marketed to after this. Read our T's and C's for the, the kind of process. My, my advice would say, at that point, say to them, you're opting in for marketing. We're going to market to you if, if you tick this box or if you fill in this form. Um, don't default to opt-in. Um, most companies don't do this anymore, um, but some, some still do. Um, make it that somebody is going to have to opt-in for your marketing rather than opt-out. 
Um, and only collect the data you need. So if you are a B2B, you are, um, so, so us as an example, we only collect things like email, phone, um, first name, last name, company name, URL, because that's what we need to be able to do our job to then sell to that person. We don't ask them for things like date of birth or kind of marital status. We don't need that information, so we don't collect it. Email is your friend. So leading up to GDPR, email is your friend. So this, this, this bit is kind of looking at our strategy specifically for um, uh, leading up to, over the next four months. Um, you have a big excuse to re-engage with people in the database and, and use it on that basis. So Michael uh, mentioned that GDPR is a marketing opportunity. Yes, you can market yourselves as being GDPR compliant after the effect, and that's great. But leading up to GDPR, you have a vehicle to start saying to people, look, we are, well, we are conforming and we are scrubbing our database. We want to know if you still want to be a part of that. Um, Remind your database why they have your details. So, you, I mean, if somebody signed up to your newsletter, remind them that they're on your newsletter because, so again, in our uh, instance, we share marketing tips and tricks, our latest blog, um, guides, webinars, all that kind of information comes out of our um, newsletters. So, over the next few months, we're going to remind people that that's why they're engaging with us. Um, so our six and flow email strategy over the next couple of months is to engage as often as possible, um, show value in what we're doing, and ask them to re-opt into the marketing that we're doing. So the way that I'm kind of looking at it is kind of like a dating process with our existing um, <laughs> our existing database. So the first few, we're re-engaging, we're saying hello, we're we're asking them, do you want to be in, do you want to be out, and if they're not responding to that point, it's kind of do you still like, do you still care about us? And then why aren't you responding? And then it's over. We don't we like we are going to leave it at that point. This this is an example um, of a uh, a GDPR email that I was sent, or a, a consent email that I was sent from uh, Book of the Future. I think a, a few of you will know um, Tim quite well. The uh, um, sorry, the, so what, what he's done here is he sent an email out saying you have three options. One is you stay in my database and I send you newsletters. Two, you stay in my database and I don't send you newsletters. Three, you opt out and I don't send you anything until you reinitiate contact. And that's, that's great. These are the kinds of emails that you should be sending to your database. My only caveat to this stuff is send them stuff prior to giving them a way out to make them understand why they should still be engaging with your brand. Because if you've not spoken to somebody in months or years that's on your database, and all of a sudden you send them an email saying, do you want out? They're probably going to say, yeah, actually, I don't want out because I don't really remember what you were doing for me. So my, my suggestion is, over that kind of that dating process, start off with showing them why it's good to be involved with you, why they should um, be using uh, your services or reading your content and then start to give them a way out, yes or no. And again, uh, so once you've flushed out the crap in your database, there's, there's some real benefits to that. So uh, regular engagements were improved. So, I mean, if you're, as, as a lot of us marketers, we are get obsessed with statistics, so open rates, click-through rates, that kind of thing. Once you've got a valuable set of data, those statistics will improve you'll start to um, see benefits from that kind of activity. And if, if you're kind of sending out emails in the hundreds of thousands, and there's, there's a cost to that, once you start to call your database, obviously those costs come down. I mean, for most of you in this room, presumably, those kind of cost implications won't really apply, but it's something to be aware of. Don't jump the gun. So you've got 134 days. You don't need to be compliant to the GDPR specifications right now. You don't have to have that opt-in right now. You should, but you have 134 days to get compliant and use these tactics to get to that point. So you can be communicating with these people. You should be trying to eke out this stuff over that period. You don't have to be squeaky clean right now. Um, and use that to your advantage. <coughs> then, 
Once you are compliant, shout about it. Use it as that marketing tactic. Um, not everybody, and they, they should be, but I can pretty much guarantee not everybody will be compliant on the 25th. Use that as a, a marketing message. We are compliant. We care about what's happening with your data. Um, it'll, it'll be a different today for you. And if you look at, so, I mean, there's a lot of you in this room already today. And a lot of that would be because there is a buzz around what's happening with GDPR. People are starting to pay attention to it. It's not just marketers and kind of CRM experts and all that kind of stuff who care about it now. It is kind of falling into the general um, consciousness. So start to leverage that. And finally, stop buying data. It's my, my personal, and again, like hands up, caveat to that. We're an inbound marketing agency. If you stop buying data, you probably have to use someone like me, and that's great. But if you're brokering in data, you don't necessarily know the provenance of that. You don't have ownership over that relationship. It is, it is depending on what you do. I mean, there, there's, there's caveats to all this stuff I'm saying, so you know, I've caveated it so you can't say I'm right or wrong. But the, using data for us detaches the brand from who you're con um, uh, connecting with. And finally, it's, it's not as scary as you're expecting. Well, in my, my opinion, it's not as scary as you're expecting. There's, there's simple things that can be done, um, and there's, there's processes that can be followed, and there's people that can help you. So Michael and his team can help people become compliant. They can look at what you're doing. They can help with this stuff. Agencies like mine can help you transition into a compliant strategy. There's, um, I mean, full, full disclosure, there are other agencies and there are other legal firms, but that's, that's you're right, it's, it's going to be okay. <laughs> that's it, that's, that's kind of our take on, on how we're approaching um, GPR. Is, has anybody got any questions? Yeah, I just wondered, with the example that you showed before, the options of yep. what to begin with, is that really It, it depends on where that data came from originally. So if they if they previously signed up to marketing, or I mean, if, if you have bought a data list and they haven't opted into that stuff, yeah, there's still going to be implications for that on the, the current kind of ICO rule. So yes, there. It, it depends is the honest answer. Um, so you are still going to be having communications with them. I can't remember the example, but someone quite recently got stung quite heavily because they were using that as a mechanism to then advertise on emails as well. So I think you need to be careful with where that data come from and how you approach it. Well, the opt-out email. Yeah. Well, they've never opted in. Um, so my my, I, I would say no. But I think it's before GDPR. It's probably a grey area. But I think that's more of a question for Michael. I would say it would be better if you can messaging them that process, saying, look, we are we have a new offering, or this is what our business is doing. <coughs> would you like to sign in rather than asking them to opt out or something? Because. The other thing that you risk is disenfranchising them from your brand because they're like, hang on, I didn't sign in for that anyway, so why are you sending me this in the first place? Roger? So, uh, guessing that you probably got like an off-the-shelf template for a campaign to have clients revalidate their lists. Is that right? <coughs> show the four steps that you guys have followed. The, this is a process that we're starting to go through. Yeah. Um, it's it's not off the shelf. I don't, 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 don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that look, everything we do is bespoke. Blah, blah blah blah. But it's we what we're doing that process. All of our clients and there's a, there's a few of you here, that we will start suggesting and helping you roll out that process to help you prepare for this stuff. So, so don't worry, we got it. So um, let's say. Come 25th of May, you've got consent from all our existing customers who use our goods and services. It would communicating through LinkedIn still give the opportunity for new customers and are you governed by their compliant GDPR policy if you 
still market your cooking services to new customers. So you mean reaching out over an email, over for example? Over an email. So my hunch, and this is probably again for Michael, my hunch to that is that they are opted in through LinkedIn yeah. to receive marketing communications. That's part of the part and parcel or the cost of using things like Facebook and LinkedIn. So it's, I, but I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it's, it's a tricky one because um, the, I think I think it, I, they're not opted in for a direct marketing communication from a third party. Um, as I as I last looked at LinkedIn's TCCs, you technically can't do that. Uh, you're right; people are going to continue doing that. And I think I think probably the distinction is if you're doing it within a within LinkedIn, so within a, a, a direct message. I think as long as you can justify that there was a some kind of connection, so somebody's had to you or followed you or they've liked something, I think you're going to be fine. I think one of the better words sort of spam is still going to land you in, in trouble, and if we have breached that TCC. So you um, have an inquiry from someone, and for that, to, to fulfil that, you need to go to a, a third party supplier, and then that person who's contacted you originally with the inquiry goes to that <coughs> third party, then comes back to you and says, you can't use my data anymore. That other third party's already got that data, so how would that work? But they, so in that example, so somebody's come to you, they've gone, but, so, so you've gone to a third party, yeah, and then, and they've, then they've gone direct to the third party. Yeah. And then they told you they don't want you to have the data anymore. Yeah, but then you're responsible for that third party. But they've gone directly to the third party. So is that okay? Well, because they've then initiated a relationship with them. Right. And removed you from the relationship. So if they've asked you to remove the data from your side, then you would have to. Okay. Okay. Good. We've got enough. Good. <laughs> Just on that, um, if, if you have recommended someone, so if HubSpot said to you, we know there's a new customer in Manchester, you're an agency that can help them. Is that legitimate interest of them passing that person's details that have filled in on HubSpot's website? <coughs> they're passing you a new lead. Is that is that fall under legitimate interest, or whose is that? Whose is that lead and that contact? Now, HubSpot would need consent or or a, or, a, or a processing condition to be able to, to dispose the data yeah. across. But once you've got that data, um, as long as it's been process lawfully by HubSpot, you should be able to make a contact. But I think you then you then need to, you know, further communications would need to, to have a, a lot of position. And, and that HubSpot relation, partner relationship, as an example, if, because HubSpot has a direct team as well, so you could go directly to HubSpot. Yeah. And the way that that relationship works is they, the direct team, will say there is an agency in Manchester or there are agencies in Manchester that can help you. Would you like us to introduce you? Yeah. So they, they do ask for that permission before they send it. And I would imagine that's that's how a lot of the SAS um, products work. Yeah. But then you will need an opt-in of that person. If I start marketing to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean if, if I've been introduced to them over email, then I could obviously respond to them and yeah. and but that doesn't mean that I'm allowed to then start hammering them with newsletters. Yeah. Yeah. When you are introducing somebody to somebody else, these, I often use an email where I put both parties in and say connect. Is that uh, giving out somebody's personal information? Uh, I, I don't, so the, the way I normally do it is I would, I would ask both parties if they're happy for me to make that introduction prior to doing it. If, if you don't do that, Michael, is that how you need that? So you need to ask that. Surely there's a little bit of realism in here that you're introducing someone. So like Roger introduced us, yeah, and now I'm a client. So the fact that whether Roger had a written record to say you need to speak to Rich, you now build my company every month. So there's a little bit of realism, isn't there? Some of this? Like, you're in, well, did you? Okay. I mean, I get if you're doing like thousands and thousands, but if you're like, oh, I know someone that can help you, I'll introduce you. I think. Mark. There's only actually, in, in, a, in a real world, I'm not saying like, yeah. Let's be honest. You quite often government bodies don't sit in a real, real world. It's if you introduce someone and it's a benefit, they're not going to complain and go, thanks, I'll take the client, but have you got consent to really TC me? Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you're right, but that's not the way, that's not the way the regulations sit. I, I guess the problem is you make a bad introduction. 
So you assume it's going to be lost. You're 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 going to be lost. you are going to be lost 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 you are going to be
guess that falls into legitimate interest, potentially, as long as it's not marketing material. But again, one from Whitehall. I think, it, yeah, I agree with the marketing. I think for marketing, we've got two options. We either get the MD to confirm that he has the weapon that he's sent to allow you to add anybody else to the mailing list, which I'd be slightly surprised if they would do, um, or you're going to have to get individual consent from this person. But that's only on marketing material, that's not yeah, communications. Yeah. yeah, okay. Any any last questions? Okay. So final final poll. Who who at least thinks that they have more of an understanding of GDPR than, than when we started this morning? Good. Right. Perfect. Um, we we're going to circulate um, the slides for this. Um, there's a video um, that will go around, so obviously we need to edit that a little bit so that will take us a few days to get out. Um, and then there's the live video, I think it was on YouTube. So all of this content that you've heard today and kind of talk will all be live and um, um, Michael and I will both be around if anyone's going to questions for the next half an hour or so. Um, but thank you for coming. It's, it's great to have you here. Thank you.